Good morning. I'm Reverend Karen Brammer. I am the part-time minister here and thrilled to be among you. It's always so good to see you all. I would like to invite Bob to do our prelude to help welcome us in and settle us into our own skin. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Here in the Unitarian Universalist congregation, it is our theology, our joy, our hope that when anyone walks into this space or is among us, that you feel no matter what your history has been, whatever your faith, if you had a faith or have a faith, no matter what you believe, no matter how you define who you are in relationship, no matter who you love, you are welcome here. You are most welcome here. This is the land of the Haudenosaunee, the ancestral lands of the Oneida and the Mohawk. And we're very cognizant that we live in a culture that has grown based upon systemic oppression of different peoples. And so mindful of that, we've, we're, we love this land and we intend to be in right relationship in all the ways that we can possibly can. And now I'm going to invite a few folks up to make announcements. First, I think Barb should come up since she's got a prop. Of course. 
Do you want the mic? So no. Nope. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to move it. That's my style. <laughs> I do have a prop. It's what teachers do. So the climate action team has two requests of you. One, we are needing more hoses. I've already donated three of my extra hoses. And some of the people to whom we bring trees are not able to bring water to fill this wonderful pail that has one little hole drilled by Matt Cavalieri in it. And so they, need, they have an outdoor spigot and they ask for hoses. So if you have any extra, I already got rid of three of my extra ones. Number two and last one, today after church, after coffee hour, don't want to miss that. Um, I am going to deliver five of these pails to folks in Utica. And I would like two or three people to accompany me, if you can, for two reasons. One, it's great to meet the residents who get the trees and teach them about keeping the tree healthy. And number two, someday I might not be able to do this and somebody else needs to know how to do it. Thanks. Thank you. There, uh, there are more card tables in the closet, Marilee. If there's a need for another card table, there's one right behind you. My goodness. Yes, please, Deb, come forward, and then I have an announcement after you. Um, there'll be an orientation for visitors and um, newcomers to the church following the service will be in the room right there with the door to the left. Um, it'll be an open free exchange, quite casual. You come and go as you choose, like most things in here. Um, and I hope you'll join us. My announcement has to do with the fact that that room used to be what we'd call kid space. I think that kids recognize this more than most of us. That used to be kid space. And the reason it's not kid space anymore is because we're swapping. There are more children and there are people here. Alita, would you stand up and say hello? Alita is going to train adults how to do a program called kid spirit play, spirit play. And it's a combination of a Montessori kind of program with our Unitarian Universalist values involving a lot of art and creativity. So the kids who are used to going back in that space are no longer gonna go back in that space, as hard as that is. And instead there are art supplies and there will be fidgets to keep fingers busy. You'll, when you stand up and look there, there's a big red heart near the floor. There are a whole bunch of supplies for anybody who wants to be at the card table, no matter who, how old you are. If it's better for you to have something in your hand or to color, to, to do something creative, you're welcome. And so um, I will also announce that at the end of this service, the children who would like to decorate that new space are gonna come with me and Julie, who's right back here. Julie and I are gonna go over with the children and we're gonna decorate that great big space and make it yours, okay? Great, okay. So with that, I am, um, let's see. I asked Chris if he would come forward to light our chalice this morning. And as most of you know, in the Jewish community, there have been satyrs. So this chalice lighting, the words come from a Passover Haggadah. May the light we kindle inspire us to use our powers to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to bless and not to curse, to serve you, O oh spirit of freedom. Thank you. May it be so. Rabbi Michael Malzer wrote the following words, and it was Rabbi Peter uh, Schachman, who's over in Emmanuel, who shared this with me. I sent him a text to wish him a beautiful Passover, and he sent this back to me. And these are his words, Rabbi Malzer. Standing on the parted shores of history, 
we still believe what we were taught before Moses received the Ten Commandments at Sinai, that wherever we go, there will always eternally be an Egypt, an Egypt of human enslavement and pain. But wherever we go, we know there is a better place, a promised land. The winding way to that promise passes through the wilderness. That there is no way to get from here to there, except by joining hands and moving together. If you would use your blue hymnal, I hope you have access to one near you, on page 1011. Melissa is going to lead us in return again. Bob is going to play this melody through once for you so you can hear it. And then we are going to uh, sing it with the repeats. So you're going to sing the first two lines twice, the second two lines twice, and then the first two lines again twice. Don't worry, it'll work out. Stand as you are willing and able. Together time, you might wonder, since it's in the order of service, is a time that the children and young at heart are welcome to come forward or remain where you are, but this is a time for you. Now, I'm going to, you know, everybody looks so comfortable where you are, coloring, so I'm going to just stay here unless you'd like to come forward, but there will be a time when I want to hand you something for you to share during the service. So once there were children who loved a special place called Kid Space. The kids recognize this. Yeah. And then the adults, like sometimes adults do, decided to change that even without talking to the kids. But we decided to make a bigger space and a more beautiful space for you and that will have two teachers in it during worship for you to do spirit play, which is a beautiful, wonderful, fun thing to do. But the children thought, wait a minute, we want to say in this. So the adults thought and thought and said, okay, why don't you decorate the space and make it your own? So when you walk in, you know it is your space. Now, I wonder what the children would make to decorate such a space for your spirit playroom. So I have some shapes that you can use or you can make your own shapes during the service. And then afterwards, Julie and I will go with you to the other room and you can decorate, okay? Here are some of the shapes. Make sure you put your name on it, okay? Thank 
Thank you. We are growing and we are working to create the future of this faith that teaches love and acceptance and interdependence. So this sermon, oh, let's do a reading from Reinhold Niebuhr first. On page 461 in your gray hymnal, 461. Many of you know the name Reinhold Niebuhr. Yeah, 461. Now, for some of us, this language is very comfortable. It talks about being saved. And for others of us, we're very uncomfortable with the language of being saved. But as you read this with me, as you are welcome to do, I'm not required, 461. Um, think about all the different ways that you are saved each day or help someone else be saved or save themselves from something else. So I am going to read the words that are in normal type. And I'm going to invite you all, if you would like, you can repeat, well, read the words below. So Reinhold Niebuhr writes, nothing worth doing is completed in our lifetime. Therefore, nothing true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. Nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. No virtuous act is quite as virtuous from the standpoint of a friend or a foe as from our own. Therefore, we are saved by the final form of love, which is forgiveness. Thank you all. Similar to what we just read together, David Osberger wrote, nothing we intend is ever without fault. Nothing we attempt is ever without error. And nothing we achieve without some measure of finitude and fallibility we call humanness. We are saved by forgiveness. Forgiveness is a matter of the heart as well as the mind. I know I wrestle, and I know many of you wrestle on and off with forgiveness at different times in our lives with different people. We wrestle with things that we've done poorly or left undone. We wrestle with forgiving ourselves, wishing we had not done something. We struggle with whether or not to forgive others. We hope to someday be forgiven. Forgiveness is so real, but in case I was tempted to be academic, I'll tell you a brief story that could be very, very long and still ongoing, that when I lived with my folks, they came home from church one day vi visibly upset, really shaken. They had just found out in church that a member of the congregation had been drinking the night before and on her way home from the bar hit three young people on the side of the road accidentally and she was so distraught she kept driving so it became a hit and run and that morning she was arrested for the death of two students and the permanent maiming of a third mom and dad and i all know the driver and she's a person who helps with deliveries of food from the food pantry to people who need it. I took Qigong with her once. She is funny, a bit rough around the edges, but a good, good person with a drinking problem. I have no idea 
how she will be able to forgive herself in prison where she will live most of her life. My heart aches for her and for the families of those boys, for the family of the woman herself. Forgiveness seems to me almost as important as love, if in some ways not more important. So why is it that Unitarian Universalists really tend not to talk about forgiveness very much? I think it has to do with back in the 1700s, our four parents were pushing against the culture that believed that people are born sinful. They were pushing against that. So in universalism in particular, there was a massive push away from sinfulness and towards bringing people back into love. So it does make sense, given where we came from. But even now, if you are curious and want to look in the back of our hymn book where they um, categorize hymns and readings, there's no title called forgiveness. There's no title called sin. So one of the early, actually the first universalist minister who came to the shores of the continent um, in Massachusetts, and what is Massachusetts now, was named Reverend John Murray. He preached very radical stuff. You may possess a small light, but uncover it, let it shine. That was radical. Use it in order to bring more light and understanding to the hearts and minds of men and women. Radical. Give them not hell, but hope. Preach the kindness and everlasting love of God. So talking about forgiveness in our faith community would probably mean we would eventually need to talk about evil and sin, and that's another sermon. Today, I should clarify what I mean when I talk about forgiveness. It's not the same thing as um, when, for instance, in my family, where if um, I almost break my brother's pinky by hanging on to it because he was so much bigger, I could wrestle him down with his pinky, but it really hurt, and I was told to apologize, but I didn't feel like apologizing, but I was made to apologize, so I said, I'm sorry, and he knew, he knew I wasn't sorry. Forgiveness is not in this realm. Somehow, we have to teach our children something about apology or forgiveness that is different from using the words that we may or may not mean. So I think actually it is more about a mindset of knowing that we will hurt each other unintentionally and intentionally, that as human beings, there will be mistakes and there will be mean things. And if we assume that's gonna happen, then we may be less likely to take it on personally, although sometimes it's very targeted at us, but that if we create a mindset for ourselves that is more an orientation towards people make mistakes and will continue to make mistakes, then perhaps when there's hurt, we're more able to address it and let go of it. And this is where Forgiveness has been a, a real challenge for me in my life. I grew up with sexual abuse. I have had different situations in which there is no way that I would ask myself or anyone else to just forgive because there needs to be accountability. The thing that is important to me that I've learned in my own life and I saw through battered women's work, through all kinds of work in the culture, and many of you know this to be true, is that when we've been hurt, we are energetically hooked. There is a hook in our hearts that connects us with a hook in the heart of the person who hurt us. Vice versa, if I hurt someone, I've created a hook 
in that person's heart that is connected to my heart. And it creates a dynamic of pain and tension. And so for me, forgiveness is a mindset. It is a, it's a desire to move back to getting unhooked. It's a desire to move into a sphere of anticipating people will make mistakes. And so when there is a, a terrible offense, I know that the inability to eventually forgive, I never ask myself to forgive immediately. I take a breath and give myself time. But when there's been an offense, I know that my inability to forgive can force myself into a toxic, long-term, painful situation because it takes energy to keep that person out of my life. And we know that when you're creating a lot of energy to push something out, you end up, that's what you're focusing on. And you end up acting towards that instead of being free to move towards the spirit of freedom. And so in whatever way we can begin to forgive, whatever way we can open our hearts and say, yes, humans, humans are so full of fault. And we can expect that, that when we're able to move towards letting go, moving towards forgiveness, imagining even what forgiveness would look like. I mean, you think about the horrendous situations of the world right now, I would never ask someone in the Palestinian community to forgive the Jews. I would never ask the Jews to forgive the Palestinians, even though there are people within those contexts who are working towards that all the time. It's hard. I was, I was told that I needed to forgive an abuser, a long-term abusive person who had power in my life. I was told by a doctor that I wasn't gonna get well until I forgave that person. And I was a teenager. There was, it was so unhelpful to be told I had to forgive. It would have been more helpful to be aware that the feelings I carry around about someone who has hurt me affect me and affect that other person and that exploring what it means to forgive will be different for each of us and it's worthy of that effort it is really worthy and there are palestinians and jews everywhere who were working on that process I would be the last person to judge someone if they cannot forgive or not in a place where they can forgive, but we can all work towards something else. Now, one of the things that I needed to do was um, some of those of you who are Buddhist practitioners may know that there's a, a four, pot, four part posture. Um, I used this when I was fired from a job on uh, not rightfully. And this posture was designed to just keep, try to keep opening our hearts. So what it is, it's a four part bow. So you have your hands above, you, you bend at the waist and have your hands in prayer this way, and then down and then on your knees, and then reverse it with your prayerful hands, your seeking hands all the way back up. And that recommendation was to do it 10 to 100 times a day, depending on what you need. <laughs> I never got over 20. And I tend to grunt when I do this. So that's why I'm not demonstrating, but I grunt. And it's just not very meditative, you see. But something began, it's almost like I had a log, log jam in my chest. And as I made the effort, as I made my intention clear, the log jam began to dislodge. It's not magic. It's about intention. It's about focusing my mind in a way that helped me imagine something different. 
Ooh. The first funeral I ever did in 1998 was for a teenager, a young woman, Kelly, who was killed in a car accident when the driver, her boyfriend, sped too fast around a corner. He lived. He was arrested and in court did not try to defend himself. Marge, the mom of the beloved Kelly, now buried, decided the driver had suffered enough simply by surviving. So she spoke in court on behalf of this young man in court to not punish him, that he has suffered so much and that he would use his pain to serve others and try to heal. So she helped him set an intention to forgive himself as well. And she set an intention in the court to make room for this young person to use what had happened to do well in the world. And that's what happened. I was stunned and awed by the example of this woman. So forgiveness is a practice. Extraordinary teachers, Jesus, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Gandhi, all taught forgiveness as a frame of mind, a direction. Forgiveness and love attached to love that was empowered, love that would act, ahimsa, love that acts. And so forgiveness is not rolling over. Forgiveness, in my understanding, is a set of our intentions and creates more of a sense of freedom in those of us who are hooked by that pain and that damage. So I'm imagining that a culture like ours has the ingredients to foster the possibility of forgiveness, right? We have a culture that nurtures care. We want to recognize the uniqueness of each of us. We want to assume that when we're in relationship, it means when we make mistakes, we'll try to stay connected and work through it. So, it would be an amazing gift to know that walking into this culture, into this community, and into communities like this where the intention is set, that there's the possibility of forgiveness. Hmm. So people who have made damaging mistakes, people who live with addictions, people who have served in the military or the police or some, some work that in which they were forced or chose to engage in their work in a way that caused them a moral wound. That's a thing among the military is moral woundedness, where learning to forgive oneself is essential, is essential. So along with bowing, if you have knees for that kind of thing, there is also a gorgeous um, thing called tashlik. I don't know if any of you know of this. Tashlik is a, a very old Jewish custom of, if you just put your hand, if you have pockets, put your hand in your pocket and see if there's anything like lint or crumbs or threads. And if you have some, hold it up. If you have anything like that in your pocket, hold it up. Well, that lint, those crumbs, whatever, dare I say, garbage is in your pocket. It's harmless garbage in your pocket. Tashlik is a time when the Jewish community takes those linty things out of their pockets and go to a body of water. And with the intention of forgiving oneself and others, you toss that lint and those crumbs into the water. It's a fun, funny, joyful event done in community. It comes from the uh, book of Micah. 
when the prophet reassures saying that God will cast all the sins into the depths of the sea. What a blessing to know that one can actually be forgiven and one can forgive another. So whether or not one believes in God, Unitarian Universalists covenant, not just believe, we covenant to practice living as if love is possible, to practice living as if forgiveness is possible, if not now, someday. And that we do not move through the desert of human degradations and alienation alone. We do so together. And with that, I'm going to invite Ken to come forward, who has an activity that some, did I miscommunicate something, Ken? Oh, good. Ken from the social justice team is going to come forward when he's done with his reverie and announce something that the social justice team is doing that if you're interested and willing, you can participate in. Are you ready? Come on up. This is Ken Drake. <laughs> the uh, Democracy Action Task Force is developing a campaign to promote a common vision for America as part of our work in support of a pro-democracy movement which is being coordinated by the Unitarian Justice, um, UU Social Justice uh, Democracy Action Team. It's a, it's a, it's a national effort. Um, in the newsletter last week, we asked three questions we want you to answer. Uh, for your benefit, I replicated them uh, and posted them on the, on the door, at the storeroom door at the back of the sanctuary and I ask that each of you, if you are so inclined, to respond to one or more of the questions. Um, the point is that um, we believe that there is a, uh, our country is, is not headed, headed in the right direction. And uh, if there's any effort that we can do to uh, right the ship, we will do so. Also, I have communicated with most of the UU churches in upstate New York, and I'll say the, the, any, almost all the churches not on Long Island or in New York City. And uh, through uh, uh, Reverend Karen's uh, cooperation, uh, we, I've drafted a, a letter to them, sent an email to them, and asked for their support in our work as well. And um, we're, I'm excited that we can uh, perhaps collaborate more statewide and perhaps uh, influence this uh, national effort because they do ask for input from congregations like ours and i think we have we have the the intellect here and the, and the uh, desire to see an improvement in america so please take a few minutes answer the questions and uh it'll be also posted in the newsletter uh, next week as well okay thank you very much So here we are actively mm, dancing between stillness and action. And so I invite you to turn a gray hymnal to 352. Find a stillness, 352. When you're ready, please rise, embody your spirit. Spirit by the 
spirit, with the spirit giving power, I will find true harmony. Thank you. Please be seated. Hmm. Would you take a breath if you're so inclined and feel your feet, the end of your legs, whether they're propped up or on the ground, feel where the top of your head is, be present in your body and take a breath, breathing in the love that is here, that is real and breathe out all that you need to let go of. Breathe in whatever bits of freedom that you can allow yourself by forgiving yourself. And breathe out a sense of relief, more space in your heart and soul. As we are gathered here, may all that we say and do serve to increase love. May all that we say and do with each other serve to increase the possibility of forgiveness and justice in our world. With gratitude for every being in this space, for gratitude for the trees that surround us and the sky and the earth below, with a sense of wonder that we are in this universe. Thank you. Blessed be and amen. Jeff, there you are. I'm still Jeff Chard. <laughs> look at us. Take a minute to look around. We are 70 strong today. I'm seeing, I'm seeing people I haven't seen before. Um, I'm seeing people I haven't seen nearly as often. And I'm seeing people who have been here longer than myself, uh, longer than the 45 years I've been coming here. Uh, what a community we have. Uh, you've heard me, you've seen me up here a couple of times to talk about the stewardship campaign. And I know you're all going to be sorry that I'm really not going to be talking about that week after week anymore. When the uh, finance committees uh, made their projections, and when we talked about our needs, we set a stretch goal of $94,000. Um, our budget people thought if we could get anywhere close to $90,000, uh, we'd be good. Uh, today, we are at $91,000. <laughs> and that's all you. That's everybody here. Everyone who pledges, everyone who contributed, everyone who contributes, everyone who makes gifts, that's how we got there, because we support our own congregation. Um, churches everywhere took a real hit when uh, COVID came. You know, we had to close our doors for two years, I think, maybe more. Uh, we got an online presence. We started to build that online presence up. Sometimes we had seven people. Sometimes we had 13. Uh, sometimes we had 40. Uh, today, to see us in this room, to see children, to see uh, uh, 10 or so people online at this moment, uh, it's, it's just amazing. And again, you know, this is, this is our community, this is your community, and uh, it's a beautiful sunny day, and yet here we are <laughs> to be in community and to be inspired. Thank you, Karen. Uh, 
there's anything, any way that the church can serve you that we're not doing, if you have any ideas, please let one of us know. Uh, you may notice there are a couple of dots of blue tape. Uh, we think that that's gonna be where a TV goes so that we will be able to stream General Assembly, be able to watch cartoons if Karen isn't as wonderful as she was this morning. <laughs> We have plans, we have ideas. <laughs> the financial support that you've given, and we don't have to be done yet, but uh, the financial support that you've given is making our plans possible. Thank you all so much. Oh my, 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 my. whether or not one believes in God. Unitarian Universalist covenant, we covenant together to practice living as if love is possible. We promise to covenant, we covenant to live as if forgiveness is possible, if not now, someday. And that we do not need to move through the desert of alienation or injustice alone but we do so together. May it be so. Oh, the, I thought you were gonna announce the offering. We got so inspired. Yeah, yeah. Once I said during an offering, gosh, you know, now it's time for the offering. And if you really need money more than you can give, just take some out. And, and the leaders went, what? <laughs> Would the ushers now collect the offering and we're gonna have some beautiful music from Bob and this offering serves the vision which extends beyond the walls of this congregation out into the larger community. May it be so. Rabbi Nachman wrote, Oh, hear my people, hear me well. I have no need for sacrifice, but rather mercy 
loving kindness shall alone for life and good suffice. Then source of peace lead us to heal, lead us to peace, a place profound and wholly true. May it be so for us all. And I'll invite you to read the words for extinguishing our chalice, which has decided to extinguish itself. <laughs> we extinguish this flame. And I'll remind you all that in that corner, we'll be gathering people who'd like to learn more about the congregation and orientation. And in across the hall and in the big room on the other side of the hall, children and adults who want to support this process with Julie and I will be decorating that space for spirit play. And so enjoy visiting with one another. May you be well, go in peace. <laughs>